Chapter Five of the Spring of Joy by Mary Webb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. To whom care in prison keeps and sickness doth suppress. In his bed he may lie, and enjoy the whole world. Sir Thomas Brown. Along these channels of joy, laughter and beauty, vitality will flow into mind and body, when other channels are dry and filled with drifts. Invalids are too much shut away from the golden unrest, the busy quiet of nature. When a doctor who knows that earth is his ally says, Take him out, distract his mind. Well-meaning relatives take him to the scenes of his past activity. They never find out their mistake because he tries with fierce determination not to be a fool. He applauds with the rest when another man does what he once excelled in. But do we not all know that difficult smile of his? He is seeing not the bright day and the blue eyes of hope, but the contrast between his former and his present self. To him the whole thing is a kind of horrible medicine. He prefers his sick room. People without much imagination do not realize what pain they inflict when they persuade some girl, who will never dance again, just to come and watch. They arrange everything for her physical comfort, and then show her whose beauty is worn, whose girlish life is over, clearly and vividly what she has lost. Only a saint could bear this with equanimity. Not even a saint could benefit by it in bodily health. In nature there is a sure harbour, for things that once engrossed the mind begin to look pale and small when seen in conjunction with the immense brilliant perspectives of hill and sky. So life's values right themselves again. The clean breath of truth blows through this tameless world. Here are no enervating doctrines of the need of punishment through sickness. Here is no unwholesome atmosphere of self-pity and apology for bodily disability. It is hard, if people are young and eager for action, to be chained by physical weakness. It is grievous to be forced to lead a life of contemplation when the heart is set upon roaming, to be placed upon a philosophical hillside when you are all afire to be down in the plains amid the sweet, keen trouble of living. Yet a charm clothes all things seen from a hilltop. Nothing disturbs the quiet but such melodious sounds as the long iteration of a dove or the bleating of sheep, content hidden in melancholy. Through the still air come mysterious calls and echoes, remote as dreams, provocative to the imagination as a half-told romance. Looking into the world of nature from sick room or garden, one finds out how lovely the near things are. The one tree or field will reveal depths on depth of beauty to the long, concentrated gaze. When the sky after sunset is unclouded, except for some mauve lines in the east, like hyacinths under dew, sloping to a calm blue sea, the cripple will wait with a deeper thrill than the rest of us for the coming of the moon. When she glides along the hyacinth banks, a silver boat, slipping into the sea, leaving in her wake a trail of foam, he can pass with her through the midnight skies as she moves, rudderless with no mast, an argosy of dreams for men, threading the riding lights of the stars, sailing straight on to her harbour in the dawn, drawn up at last upon an opal shore. The paralysed lad can send his heart with the gyre falcon on a day's journey from blue girdled Iceland to the Scottish homes of the rock doves and back, or he can go with the current of the great river that flows, 
like the rivers that watered Eden, with millions of side channels and lesser streams, but with ever undiminished velocity, from the uttermost point of the April tree root to the uttermost point of the leaf, flowing faster than the blood in the body, and bearing on its flood the colour of the leaf, the scent of the flower. Through any window may be seen the same gracious depths of blue air as Buddha contemplated through the interstices of his tree, as Michelangelo saw through the windows of the Sistine Chapel. The long gaze of a sick man may probe as far into the illimitable as they did. In the vast caverns of space, where Sirius lights the traveller, a genius and a weary invalid are equals, both frail as stardust, both elder brothers of the sun. The reflections that will weave themselves across the beauty of earth, the sanity that a deep knowledge of earth gives, will help to balance judgment of the world's conflicts. Life in the green country makes philosophers, and humanity needs young philosophers, full of the intellectual fire and vigour that are lost in age. None are better fitted for this than they whose powers, circumscribed but unimpaired, are all focused on the mind, and who are honest thinkers because they live amid the integrity of nature. For all who are cut off from complete spiritual intercourse with their fellows, who are in the world, but not quite of it, life is difficult and burdensome. But the loss of sight or hearing need not lessen their power of absorbing nature's messages and vitality. If they have lost the sunsets or the songs, these messages will be translated into scent or a wave of sensation. One sense may bring dreams and echoes of another. You can see green water shadows when the scent of meadowsweet is in the air, and hear remembered music when a certain light is on the hills. The satin touch of a peony petal recalls its pink sheen, and the feel of a silken barley sheath brings the surge and murmur of the field. The blind will hear the faintest notes in the music of earth, will feel touches soft as a moth's wing on hand and heart, will live in a world of elusive fragrances from which others are excluded. The deaf will see further into the rainbow than the rest of us, and the feel of water on the hand, air on the face, moss underfoot, will be their service of song. Sweeter even than the exquisite things we know, transparencies, veins in leaves and flowers in the water where it bends over a fall, the cream and madder of pear buds, the scent and music of rain, are the rare breaths and gleams that come only to a few. The blind and deaf can travel a long way by the strength of their enforced concentration on the senses left to them, up the paths of light, scent and music, which seem to converge as they ascend, until they melt altogether in mystery. How far they will go, and how much they will find out, no one can tell, but it is their benign work to show us the delicacy of creation filling the spaces between the old, stable pleasures with these subtle new ones, like daffodils planted between apple trees. These stricken men and women, from whom the world falls back as from a sanctuary where noise is muffled, may be aware, in the close and thrilling calm about them, of diviner existences, a more ethereal being. Then, gazing with the undimmed vision of the soul towards the ultimate beauty, which is the meaning of all symbols, they will know the wonder that is a sacramental act of homage. The men and women who most of all need peace are those who are smitten with some incurable disease. Their lives cannot be normal, and the sense of injustice and of difference from others combined with their despair, 
saps what little strength they have. The seared spirit must have silence. In one of earth's tranquil haunts, a man may lay his head on her green pillow. At first, perhaps, he will see death looming like a black chasm across his days. But when he has dwelt for a time between the green and the blue, when he has looked long at the broad skies and considered the punctual return of life after death in spring, it may be that he will come to the consciousness of mystery brooding over the world. And because intuition tells him that death will take him a step nearer to this mystery, he will cease to think of it as a chasm and regard it rather as a gate on the skyline. Just as one stands at the foot of a steep field and sees in the hedge at the top a gate that opens on the blue, so he will see his short life as an upward slope, steep but leading to a white gate swinging upon the infinite. He will have a heritage of joy while he climbs the ascent. Sweet things about him, the warm comfort of some little creature's body pressed against face or heart, the pleasure of a bird's bright eyes looking into his, its fugitive wings pausing in their flight for him. He will know the wonder of a wild creature's confidence when, instead of eluding him, it seeks his friendship. A thing as strange and joyous as if a star came sweeping from her station to light up his brow. The hearts of these dumb beings are sealed to us. Their lives are wrapped in shadow. Might not the sick, by their genius for sympathy, help to bring the day when we shall cease to make ourselves ridiculous in the theatre of the cosmos by thinking that our neighbours, the people of the fields, were made for our sole benefit, and when corpses of the defenceless will be seen no more upon the tables of those who profess the gospel of love. One who has lived under the large arbitratement of earth ceases to question. There is a hand on the hot forehead. He meets death with the absence of morbidity, almost amounting to indifference, which you find in the gay, short-lived citizens of wood and meadow. Death is no longer either the supreme disaster or the supreme desire, but an incident, the swinging back of the gate on the skyline. He begins to link himself with the beauty that lies in and beyond the beauty of earth, like light in a flower. An intuition begins to dawn in him that this beauty, or love, is not only above all things, but in them, permeating them. That he, and the very germ of disease that destroys his body, abide in it as inevitably as the world abides in the invisible air. When each breath is drawn in this eternal atmosphere, now and forever are one. Today and in a million years, here and beyond the uttermost star, we are in the heart of God. In whatever way and to whatever extent people are set aside from the world, they can make their lives magnificent, bringing an evangel of peace to the travel-worn companies of men. They dwell in the land of consolation, beside the healing watercourses, lily-bordered, poplar-circled, flowing purely from the divine sea. In this land, no visible country, they are caught away into holiness by the vision that they see when a leaf unfolds, or when the birds make low, moonshiny music in the dusk. To them life comes pulsing down the sunbeam, whitening in the clover, fleeting in the wind. If invigorated by this vitality, cured of soul sickness or body sickness, they take up their work again, they may still live as the plant lives, whose everyday doings are a lyric. Walking among men with the light of their abiding joy in their eyes, they can beautify the workaday world. They can gather up nature's ancient memories, her twining prophecies, and bind them about men's work and faith, 
linking ordinary and common things with the miraculous and remote. They can be like flames passing through filthy places, scorching, cleansing, growing in light by feeding on darkness. When a man ceases to find in the natural world material aims only, when, watching a flower, he can almost see the artist's hand lift from the pencilling of its transparent veins, then he will have attained such strong freedom that he will stand already on the foothills of eternity, gazing with love and wonder into the complex life of nature, which is the life of God. Once, on a clear winter day, a wide stretch of ploughland lay before me. It was beautiful in the rich colouring and fertility of its shallow, faintly shadowed furrows. But it was still and silent, as nature seems to those who see nothing within and beyond it. Suddenly I was aware of swift, continual motion all over the brown land. Up and down the furrows gleamed the white breasts of plovers. In a moment they rose with a flashing of underwings in the light, and their plaintive cry came down through the thin air, united to the soil by all the ties of life, being its very essence, they were yet much more. They were the soul of the field, gifted with music and motion, and the freedom of the sky. So, at first, the patient watcher of earth sees only inanimate beauty, voiceless, without initiative. Then, suddenly, there is a clapping of wings, a flash of immortal radiance, a strange, haunting cry, and he has had a vision of the soul of the world. End of chapter 5 and End of the Spring of Joy A Little Book of Healing by Mary Webb